Hi, I'm Bobby Halton. I'm Rhoda Maker. And we're asking you for a favor. We need you to show up to do the stair climb at City Field. On October the 10th. It's the first national stair climb sponsored by the FDNY and the National Fallen Firefighters. And I gotta tell you, if there are 16,000 firefighters in the city of New York alone, 1,500 should be a piece of cake. They're saying it's impossible. But there's nothing impossible for the American Fire Service. We promise to never forget. Rhoda May and I are asking you. Help us help others to be successful. Thanks. Hi, this is Bobby Halton, and welcome to today's webcast brought to you by Fire Engineering, Fire Rescue, Firefighter Nation, and Fire Apparatus and Emergency Equipment Magazines, the Penwell Fire Group. Today's event, Main Street Fires, Is Your Department Ready?, will be presented by my dear friend Joe Pernesti, who's an assistant chief and a shift commander at the Eloria Fire Department in the great state of Ohio. My good friend Joe's a 26-year veteran of that department, where he's an assistant chief and a shift commander. He's also a graduate of Ohio's Fire Chief Executive Officer Program and a lead instructor at his community college, Fire Academy. He's a huge contributor to fire engineering. He's a great friend. He's got a fantastic website on our Fire EMS blogs that he runs with our good friend, Chris Nam. And today he's, gonna, he's also going to be at FDIC this year doing Main Street Tactics and Strategies, Are You Ready? Speaking of FDIC, registration open today. So if you're planning on coming to FDIC, Now's the time to go register and get your hotel room. Can't tell you how many times I get phone calls from y'all around oh, the first week of April or so saying you can't get downtown. Well, with 30,000 plus folks coming, it's important that you register early. And it's also how you get into all the great classes. All the workshops are up and all the hot classes are still open. So now's the time to register for FDIC. One other thing, you just saw the quick video of May Kerr and I, please asking you to consider if you're in that New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Long Island, uh, Ohio area, and you can get down to City Field, you can still participate in the first national stair climb sponsored by the FDNY and the NFFF. You can register on site. The registration will be, be on site. Just get down there you know, before 7.30 in the morning at, at City Field. It would be an amazing day. City Field's a beautiful place, and it's a chance to really show people that we really have not forgotten. So please consider going to the National Stair Climb. So before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. You know, you can do all kinds of things, but most importantly, you can ask questions. So if you've got a question for Joe, just click that Ask a Question button, that Q&A widget, and submit your questions. We'll get to all the questions at the end, so we won't interrupt Joe during his presentation. At the end, Joe and I will jump back on and try to answer as many questions as we can. If we can't answer everybody's questions, we'll send them to Joe, and Joe will put them up on fireengineering.com where this presentation will be available within 24 hours of the live event. If you've registered, we'll send you a link to it. So if you're going to use it for your weekly training or your monthly training with your volunteer group or your, or your, or your opposing shifts, uh, you, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. We sure do appreciate that you all do that. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend Joe Pernesti, uh, Main Street Joe, as I like to call him. And, and Joe, take it away, and thank you so much for, for doing this for us today. Uh, thank you, Chief. I, I appreciate it. I just want to say hello to everybody out there. We have a lot to cover, and we're going to try to do our very best. And like the Chief said at FDIC, if, if you enjoy this presentation, we'll be giving a uh, expanded version where we'll really will dig down deep into uh, Main Street fires. As you can see there, I have a Chief who's blacked out. His face is his uh, city's blacked out, and I put that up there because it, at one time the main street, I'm talking your downtowns or your, your central squares, uh, parts of your town, they were the hub. And that's where everybody went uh, to do their shopping and so on. Then in around the 60s, uh, the enclosed malls came about and, and people's tastes changed and they moved away from their main street. Well, now you're seeing a, a, a re renaissance, if you will, of downtown buildings being fixed up, renovated, and people are coming back. Well, there's one thing. These buildings are getting older, and we're having more and more fires in them. And when they hit, all eyes are on you. You could have a fire uh, all across the country. Every day there's a, there's a fire. 
Most of our fires are residential in nature. But when you have a fire on your main street, you, as a fire chief, are at the center of the attention. The media, the newspapers, TV, your mayor, safety directors, what have you. Uh, it's, it's, while it's a tragedy to lose one building, what I'm passionate about is when you lose a block or three or four buildings in a row where maybe tactics and strategy and command uh, could have improved and saved a couple more buildings or saved that block, uh, due to training and tactics, you know, we can we can say all we want, but deep down inside we know that we may have failed our citizens uh, that were sworn to protect uh, because we're just not quite up to speed on these kind of fires. I call it our main street dilemma. We do mostly single-family residential dwellings, and we, we develop single-family operational habits. Where I'm from, my department was created because of a very large downtown fire in the early 1900s that basically took out the entire downtown area. And so, you know, if you look back at your fire department, I bet you most of them were organized and, uh, and put into place because of large fires. And I bet you also in the downtown or in your commercial mercantile area. And through the years, again, we've done residential dwellings, and you cannot face the same kind of tactics and stretch the same types of lines in these kind of dwellings. One of the best things I like to say is, you know, uh, one, of, one of my best things, I guess I should say, is that you can't put a, a, a round, a square peg in a round hole. You can't cookie cutter everything. And this, uh, this is a picture of Chief Mike McNamee of the Worcester, Massachusetts Fire Department. Chief McNamee, uh, and I'm sure all, many of you out there know if you're a younger member uh, that maybe doesn't know quite a, uh, a lot that just was before your time, this is a fire that occurred in Worcester that uh, tragically took the lives of six firefighters. Uh, it's, a, it's a good fire to research, and uh, I encourage you to do so. Chief McNamee was one of the, uh, the chiefs there, and he was in charge of an area of operation. And... Um, he talks about cookie-cutter approach, and I just want to play this for you real quick. Learn from this. Lessons learned. Many, many. Uh, NIOSH came out with, I believe it was nine recommendations, and we've met them all at this point. But one of, one of the big things in, in the basics that we really hit us between the eyes is we were having a tendency to look at fires in almost like a cookie cutter fashion. Right? For example, we have three deckers in New England, especially in Worcester, and we are aces at three decker fires. We, they are our bread and butter fires. We know them. We know where, if the fire is here, we know where it's going to be soon if we don't do certain things, and, and we, we do it very well. But I think, and I don't think it was just us, I think it was a lot of, a, a lot of fire departments in the country kind of looked at everything from from that perspective, whereas when you get into large area and commercial buildings, you've got to think completely differently. So, as Chief McNamee said, they were very good at three-decker type of fire, and that was the typical, that's the typical construction in the Northeast, and that's what they do. And when they were faced with this larger event, uh, they brought those same thought processes and same characteristics with, with them to that large fire that they had, uh, they lost, uh, tragically lost six firefighters. And, and that's what I see in uh, Main Street fires that are critical, uh, that you cannot do that. So let's take a look and talk real quickly about ordinary construction. What is it? And if you know NSPA uh, five types of uh, building construction, Ordinary construction falls into type three. It's type three construction. And its exterior has uh, masonry walls and combustible interior beams or trusses. So basically, some call it a lumber yard enclosed in brick. Uh, it's the most common type of building in the early 20th century. And most of the time, they'll be built to two to four stories in height. And some uh, common structural elements that you will see is that the wooden members may be required to be fire resistant up to one hour. 
and only the exterior load-bearing walls shall be non-combustible or limited combustible and shall have a minimum of two-hour rating. And the walls closest to each other are the bearing walls. Now, I encourage you, we have, I'm a big, big proponent on building construction. And unfortunately, I only have an hour here. And in my FDIC presentation, we will really delve into building construction. But you must know your buildings, and you must know how they're constructed. And building construction, to me, is number one, as it should be for every firefighter and officer. So we'll just scratch on that uh, piece of part of uh, where it's applicable for this presentation on building construction and, and specific components of Type 3. Some common features of uh, exterior features is that the first floor of these buildings are going to be mercantile, and it varies from time to time, transient. You know, years ago, you could have a shoe store that when the building was built in the 1900s, it was, it was made for shoes. Well, now it might be a dollar store or some sort of uh, a cell phone store, what have you. So the first floor is going to be mercantile, and it always is going to vary. You'll also see narrow, high arched windows. And uh, fire escapes are going to be to the rear. That's something you will not see in today's uh, new buildings. You will not see too many fire escapes. It's only specific to this type of uh, structure uh, in uh, type 4 structures as far as fire escapes. And they're usually going to be in the rear, and we'll talk more about that. And then also, just like when you get injured or you start to age, we all, uh, trust me, we all age and start falling apart, and we have to go to the doctor and get our Band-Aids and get ourselves fixed up. And these buildings uh, are the same way. And we're going to talk about the threats and the hazards to firefighters because the Band-Aids are put on these buildings, and they are sometimes they did give away to something inside being sick. And those are the important parts of the building that are holding up floors and the walls, and we'll go into that. As far as the size of it, in a main street 360, if you will, how do I identify what are, these buildings are also called unreinforced masonry buildings, which basically means they're masonry without any rebar. Uh, in today's construction, you will find in a masonry building, you will find it being reinforced with uh, rebar. And back then in the 18, 19, early 1900s, they did not have that. So they were just basically a brick building. And a good way to identify these is, again, the arches over the windows, deep recessed windows. So when you take a quick scan at the street, you can see, uh, are the windows deep and recessed in, or are they more flush with the wall? And as we go on, we'll talk about how it might give a, be a giveaway to where it's a, a true masonry building or wood frame with a brick facade. These buildings will have parapets, and their heights will vary. And again, everything that changes in the building codes, as we all know, is because of some sort of tragedy. And uh, there was a large earthquake in the 30s. And after that, uh, these buildings, some of the features were changed to make them more earthquake resistant or collapse resistant. And one of the things you'll find is that on older buildings before built before the 30s, you will have a parapet wall as high as, as possible as the architect can make them. And as the earthquake, after the changes to the codes, they were smaller. So you will find that if you find a smaller parapet wall, that may also be a good telltale, uh, a good sign that possibly the building was built after the 30s. You also find a lentil over the window, and we'll talk about what that is and what they support. And then finally, the King's Row. The King's Row is basically the brick that, was because there was no support, no rebar, you will find a, a course of brick that's turned, pulling in the other bricks, and that basically supports the wall. And if you see the header course turn, that's a good sign also that you're dealing with an unreinforced masonry building. Here we have two buildings side by side in my, in my uh, response area, in my city. And the one on the one right left, your left, you can see the deep recessed windows. The one on the right, you see a, a more tapered width. 
Now, that could mean right there that it's a wood frame building with a brick facade. And both of these buildings were built in the early, late 1800s, 1890 or so. And so here's a quick scan. And I'm very big on, and if you want to get to know your main street, you must you must get into your buildings, and that'll be the reoccurring theme uh, as we go along. But that is just a quick scan that you can see uh, from the street that may give you an idea. It might be on with a wood frame building, more of a type 5 construction, uh, or type 3. So take a look there in your, your response districts. Here, as you can see, that the, the brick facade over a wood frame, you will not find the king's row. There will be no header course turned. So, again, take a look and see what's on the front of your buildings. One of the biggest, biggest issues with these buildings are going to be the void. And something that you will not find, sure, in our residential structures, we will have voids and, and all kinds, especially an older uh, town. My town is predominantly balloon frame residential construction. So we know all about voids. But in these types of buildings, what has transpired throughout the years is when they were built, you have to remember HVAC was not what it was. And so they needed lots of light. And so you had very, very tall window height compared to what you will find today construction. Well, over the years, because of energy costs, they will lower the ceiling heights and it will create voids. As the one, in, as a picture there, you can see the, the red line. And basically, that window has almost been cut in half uh, by the void that has been dropped for the ceiling height. And fire travel, uh, I don't think I need to tell any experienced firefighter chasing fire throughout a building or a residence with large voids can be, uh, it, it can be a real, real troubling task for you and your crews and, and staffing will become a concern and, and so on. So voids are a constant headache with these buildings. And you must know that up front because I think that's the biggest issue as far as residential and commercial is that some voids may be common in both, but you will find some voids in these commercial structures that you would never even think of. And we will show some pictures of that. The lintel is a horizontal support over a window or door. And why is that important here today is that to get a size up and, and to talk and, and consider collapse and, and the hazard of the construction of type 3. It's basically a horizontal support over that window and door, and it's steel. And we all know that it'll fail, and usually at 800 degrees, it'll start to deteriorate or twist. And the thing is, is that everything, all the bricks above are supported by that, as you can see. And if you have heavy fire conditions venting on a window, we have to consider the failure of that and, and per, perhaps uh, think about a collapse occurring. So again, something that we're not used to in residential can come back to haunt us in this, these types of commercial buildings. Here we take a look at the difference in the 30s, in the 1930s, like I spoke of earlier. Uh, one of the a quick comparison is in the pre-1930s, the type of mortar that was used to hold the masonry together was a very uh, light, a sand line mortar, it's called, and over time it deteriorates, and they're basically, in some of these buildings, not much but gravity holding the bricks together. The use of what's called a let, which is basically a gap that the floor and roof joists uh, rest on. Something you probably won't find in these buildings until you take them down uh, as far as, well, a fire or when they are uh, demoed, for new buildings to go up in your area is the use of fire cut beams. And basically a fire cut beam was a beam that's cut on an angle. And that was their fire protection of the day, that when those beams were subjected to fire, the floors and the roof, everything would collapse inward. And the walls, the outside four walls would be, uh, well, hopefully would stay put and you could come right in and rebuild a new, uh, a new occupancy and there you go, keep marching along. And so that was the fire uh, protection of the time, uh, primary choice to save these downtowns was the use of fire cut beams. 
Again, the absence of any kind of rebar and uh, high parapet walls. Then on the right, you can see the post, the better use of cement, smaller parapet walls, metal hangers used for joists instead of the let, and the use of rebar. Again, this should be by no means a substitute for a good building construction course. And, but to understand these buildings, you do need to have some. Uh, and so we're going through this quickly, but if you are a young fireman, there's my advertisement again to get into the building construction and to really delve into it. It'll help you trust me as you go along in your career. We're going to take a look at real quick the hierarchy in, uh, of construction. And as you can see, you have the foundation, the column, a girder, uh, the joist, and then the, basically the floor. And a failure of a column is probably the most catastrophic event that could occur. But there is just a good picture of what exactly the terminology of what is holding up the building. And most of the time, the only places that you will get to look at these is in the basement. Uh, when you take a look, a lot of these basements are going to be unfinished, and that is the best place as you go on your familiarization tours to look and see what the construction is, is to look at the unfinished basement. Another quick construction issue is that because of time, and as we stated, the renaissance of deep downtown, buildings are in a constant state of demolition and, and building. If you see a corner building or uh, you have a corner building, always be aware, and this is something that older firefighters can teach a uh, newer firefighter. Here you can see in, in the downtown district that I cover, in 2003, there was a building there that they decided to take down. Well, they never got around to putting anything up in its place, and in 2015, it's just basically a vacant lot. But when these buildings were built, and this particular block went up in the uh, 1910 or so, in the uh, 19, early, between, before the 20s, but when these buildings went up, they were made, they were built in a row to support each other. Over time, now they're deteriorated. We've taken out the building on the end, and that's what the corner looks like. You have an exposed I-beam that is supporting the upper floors in that bottom left corner of your picture. And you can see the deterioration of the brick due to the weather, uh, weathering on that and the conditions over time. Well, why is that a big concern? Okay, you're the command officer. You pulled up. Boy, that parking lot looks like a great place to set up my master streams or to set up my power ladder. Well, that wall is deteriorated because that one time there was a building in that vacant lot. So always be aware of corner buildings. Corner buildings beware. If you see some demolition or you see uh, a corner lot, take a good look at the walls and see what's left as far as uh, the remaining building. The parapet wall. Probably one of the most important things that we need to discuss as far as our safety of our firefighters is the parapet wall. Uh, we can see different types, different sizes here. Look in that corner, upper right-hand corner. A uh, firefighter there on my department. Uh, we went up there to take a look at some parapet walls. And as you can see, the parapet wall is unprotected. It's an extension of the wall, basically, is the definition of a parapet wall. And over time, the weather conditions, freezing and thawing, those bricks, especially the older bricks with the sand lime mortar, you you, it's a great place to hide your money. And as you can see, he's pulling the brick uh, completely out. And if you wanted to, in some of these parapet walls, you could dismantle them piece by piece because they are so fragile over time. So our parapet wall is probably one of the more dangerous sections of these buildings because they are weathered and exposed to the elements. And under a fire event, it can co mm. collapse very quickly uh, out into the street. So collapse zones are a must. What are they hiding? What's the parapet wall hiding? Uh, here, this building, as you can see, the height, pre-1930s. There's a quick size up. Uh, this building was built uh, 
1870s, I believe. And as you can see, look at that beautiful high parapet wall. Well, again, what is it hiding? Uh, bottom left is a parapet wall that is hiding a bowstring truss in my district. So as you need to get around and take a look at all four corners, and again, before the fire, but these corner or these uh, parapet walls, uh, they're beautiful, but they are hiding hazards. One of the great things, the beauty of these buildings, and if you look at them from a strictly uh, architectural standpoint, the architects would put their signature on these buildings when they built them. And of course, because they were in the downtown area, it was the focal point of the community. And so they try to outdo each other. So you'll see these beautiful cornices. Upper left corner is a, what's called a cornice. And again, it's freestanding and they can be hollow. Well, it's just one more thing you gotta worry about falling on your or your firefighter's head. Um, coping stones are basically a very heavy, uh, a lot of people landscaping with these same type of things now as their driveways and sidewalks. Well, at one time they were placed on top of the parapet walls or the, uh, the, the walls of the ordinary type three buildings. And there's not much holding on those caps now a hundred years later. And again, when you go out and take a look at your buildings, take a look at those parapet or those cornices and coping stones. Will a stream be the last straw that takes those off the building and on top of your firefighters or your equipment. You also take a look at the right hand side, upper right hand corner of the working fire where you can see the cornice is basically a hollowed out uh, piece of wood that that fire is running that entire cornice. And so one more void that you're not going to find in a residential dwelling. And then there's the collapse. So again, the parapet wall is probably one of the more unstable pieces of construction that are going to be on these buildings, and we need to watch out for those. Here's something else that we need to look at. Just like in the residential with lots of talk of 360s and getting to the rear and lots of studies and line of duty deaths, unfortunately, where firefighters actually had four floors in the rear and three floors to the front or or what have you, a lot of these buildings were built on a slope. Here's something you will not find at a Home Depot that you will find on your main streets or a big box, and that is a basement. And one thing that you have to remember also is that back 100 years ago, they would receive their merchandise by train. A lot of these buildings were sloped to the rear because the set of train tracks were to the rear or a service alley was to the rear and they would get their supplies directly into the, to the basement. But why is this important? You are a, a fire chief in charge of a fire and you call mutual aid to the rear of the building. XYZ chief, go to the rear of the building, side C. Well, how familiar is that chief? Uh, what do you got back there? Well, I have a maid, I have a firefighter at the second floor window. Well, is he at the second floor window or is he at the third floor window? So all these things matter, uh, ladder selection, obviously IDing the building. So it's just one more thing to take a look at is the slope of a lot of these buildings and a lot of these districts. Fire escapes. We talked about fire escapes early on, how you will find these as the, uh, basically any time these buildings, uh, again, were built, there was mercantile on the first floor, and on the upper floors was residential. And that was their way out of the building. A lot of these buildings will have one interior stairwell and in and out for the occupants in the front and then in the rear for a fire, they have the fire escape. And just as we saw in the last uh, slide, they go to an alley. 
or a very small area, unseen for many years, well, when's the last time you've looked at your fire escapes in your district? Do they look like this one? This is one of the uh, one of my favorites in my district, and I don't think I'm sending people up and down that fire escape, and uh, I don't recommend you would either. But that is just something we have to consider is the condition of the fire escapes. Can they sustain firefighting operations or rescue? Another very common, and as we get into basements, uh, very common thing as far as access to them, a common structural element, if you will, is called the showroom bump out. Now, when you go shopping, you're not going to find this at your modern day big box. But back when these buildings were built, they were built for mercantile. They were built to showcase their their items. One of my favorite examples is it's coming up here faster than you can say it is Christmas time in the movie uh, Christmas Story. We've all seen it a billion times, most of us. Ralphie is looking in the window, the showroom window. Well, when these buildings were built, the showroom window uh, is basically the show to advertise their wares. And that's where they would put their dresses, their shoes, and uh, everything they're advertising. Well, there isn't much flooring underneath that. You have a direct access to the basement. And one of the things that you can do is if you have a basement fire, again, it's just another tool in the toolbox. It's, you might have the ability to get directly into the basement by taking a look and cutting the floor of these bump outs, these showroom bump outs. And as you can see in the left there, that that showroom bump out uh, can give you that direct access. Braces and stairs. Well, we spoke about uh, supports and band-aids as we get older. And one of the most common uh, items that you will see is a brace or a star. One of the first things you will find as a new firefighter, one of the first things that was taught to me as a new firefighter is you look for stars, look for stars. That shows that uh, there was some sort of support or alteration to the building. Again, when you're going through your downtown districts or through any type three building, take a look and see and hear um, that as you can see the different examples of supports and band-aids. Here's another picture of uh, a building, thanks to my good friends here that took this uh, Chris Nam uh, from Buildings on Fire. As you can see the circle there, you have uh, stars or support. You also have original construction braces and they can't be confused between the two and sometimes if you see the stars in different settings maybe not symmetrical in a row uh, that's a good possibility that those are there to support the building that the building has some sort of construction uh, construction uh, in, the integrity was uh, flawed at one time and they came in and repaired it but as you can see where the bottom arrows are that they had uh, posts, or I shouldn't say posts there, but construction, those plates were put in during the construction to support the floor. And here's a great example of that is you, those are symmetrical. They're not in different areas or all over the wall. Those were built with the building. They're not an extra add-on problem. And they basically, support a wood girder or the floor, as you can see, here is an excellent um, sketch of what the metal spreader plate or those symmetrical supports do. So again, the quick 360 or the quick Main Street size up, if you see stars or braces that are out of whack, they're not symmetrical, they're not in a row, danger, danger, danger. Think about it. it could be problems with the building. 
you see them in a row or see those spreader plates, they're all above the, the basement. Well, not always, but most of the time, those could be with the building. So just one more thing to build your intelligence up on these buildings. Some interior features of Type 3 is you're going to have an open stairwell. Just like in a residential, you could have an open stairwell going from the first floor all the way up. Voids, voids, voids. You're going to have narrow center halls. Why is that a concern? How many crews can you get to stretch to the upper floors? We all want to get into the fire. We all want to get up there. But the narrow stairwell can be a problem. You have to have some good command and control and some fine officer, engine officers that can control the environment and the people, I should say, up there in those narrow areas. In ceiling, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, a very aesthetic feature of these buildings. Interior doors with transoms, something you will not find, and we will talk about that in basements and cellars. Here's the interior stairs, and, and this building is under some construction on the left. That's why you see the two-by-fours there. But stretching, do you have enough hose? Residential dwelling fires, we stretch that beautiful pre-connected 200-foot line. Do you want to do that here in these buildings? Will it reach? Do you have enough? In ceiling. Beautiful, again, aesthetic feature. But here we have multiple voids because, again, the ceilings had been dropped over time for energy conservation. Now you have multiple tin ceilings. If you've ever had to pull a tin ceiling during a firefight, you will know, I am sure, you know the difficulty in trying to get tin ceilings pulled. Now imagine trying to pull double ceilings of tin. Very difficult, something you need to find before the fire and come up with a plan. Our supports, our columns. Our columns are going to be some different types. Here we have a, uh, a column that is boxed out, a perfect avenue of fire spread here. Fire spread can race through to the upper floors if it gets into or here. We have an open uh, box compared to the other one. Pipe chases. Void, 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 as I mentioned before. If you look on the left, again, these were the advertising. These were the mercantile areas. So if you walked up to the front door of these stores, you look up, you just see a beautiful or a nice uh, ceiling cover canopy. Well, what's on the other side? Guarantee you're probably not going to find that in your residential dwelling. The picture on the right is a huge void on the back half of that um, canopy. And again, these are not just the my city. These are common built features of ordinary Main Street buildings. Something that we have to take into consideration is the differences in voids. Cast iron. Again, I wish I had many hours. You guys probably don't want to hear me talking for three hours, but I wish I did have more time with you to discuss building construction. But cast iron was very common in these buildings, especially between the 1800s and 1920. And cast iron under fire conditions can become very fragile. It can fracture and fail, especially when it's heated. You put apply water. Well, if the columns and supports are cast iron, uh, you could have catastrophic failure. And in New York City, there's an entire group of buildings that they call Hell's Hundred Acres that the lofts were cast iron supports and they've lost, unfortunately, uh, many firefighters in collapses that can be traced back to the failure of cast iron columns. So I just put this slide up here uh, quickly today to say, well, when you go through your buildings, look and see if you have cast iron. If the cornerstone of the building says uh, 1853 AD, you might have cast iron, and that should be a warning sign to you as you go into the basement and look around on your tours. I call this slide potty problems. Why? Well, just like in 
residential dwellings, you're going to have pipe chases and kitchen chases and is in our common with our apartments and, and residential dwellings, they stack. Well, in these buildings, a lot of times you'll, in the mercantile, you'll have the bathroom to the rear of the mercantile and above the apartments, uh, bathrooms and, and so on. Just one more issue to have to worry about in the weight that they bring. Uh, the old cast iron tub, uh, the piping, everything. So don't forget your potty problems. And the bathroom chases normally in these buildings are going to be larger than the kitchen uh, chases and can cause rapid fire spread throughout all the upper floors and the overloading of them could be considered. Occupancy type. We can speak all day on the type of occupancy that I mentioned before. The shoe store in 1902 is now a... Uh, cell phone store in 2015. What is our occupancy? And with that, what do you have inside? A lot of Main Street furniture. Well, you have a modern fire problem in a legacy building. And so, you know, all this uh, awesome education with modern fire environment, if you're a younger firefighter, do not mistake that to mean that that doesn't happen in older buildings. It's a modern fire problem in all types of occupancy, even those of legacy. Transom, again, HVAC, you didn't have much air conditioning back when these buildings were built. How did they get ventilation? How did they get those kind of things moving, air moving? They would have transom. And as you walk through buildings, again, uh, this may bring a lot of you back to your parochial school days or your, your school days. For me, it's parochial school days where you had the classroom door and the transom. Those transoms in the upper floors of these buildings can cause a fire spread problem big time, especially if you are in a zero uh, visibility environment. You don't know that they exist because you haven't been through the building before, and now you have a, a real likelihood of fire, heat, and smoke moving out into the hall and over top of you through these transoms. So when you go through the building, take a look above the doorway and see these transoms. You may also see that the door is there, but the ceiling has been lowered to below that transom. So beyond the other side of that transom is a large void space where fire could go through that void, take out that transom, and then move on into the common area. Again, some of our problems with the upper floors, and I just want to key in real quickly on the upper floors and post stretching. You know, we we do residential dwellings, but what about the commercial building? How are you going to get that line up there? You are talking larger areas. You're not talking 10 by 10 rooms. You're talking a large area that might have been a pool hall that is now a studio apartment. Uh, so how much hose? One of the best things you can do and I hope anybody listening to me here does this, is go take some ropes and go to your downtown buildings, go to your Main Street buildings, and stretch from the street and see how much 200 feet gets you. And I think you'll be surprised. So don't just grab that two and a half. Again, another day we could spend hours and hours on fire attack and hose stretching, but just something there, point of emphasis, that 200 footer may not make it. Take some rope out in your next training day and get through the building and see what you need. What do you got on the upper floors? My uh, area is, uh, can, you know, I, I'll just say it, it's economically depressed area where I protect. And you could have anything on these floors above. There you see a single room occupancy. Uh, you also have bars uh, or just stuff, uh, hoarder issues and you need to know prior to the fire what you're getting into. Remember these are old buildings and it is difficult to get this stuff out over a hundred years so what do you do? Just set it in a corner. Uh, the single room occupancy is becoming uh, more and more common in a lot of these places for a quick rental and you know search issues can be uh, tremendous here. Life hazards and search, you know, again, there on the right, uh, the picture on the left was a working fire took out a block in a city to the south of me uh, in a college town called Athens, Ohio, where Ohio University is. And I use this picture to show 
there you have that little dormer that's there on the right above the firefighter's head. And what's behind it, that apartment on the right was occupied in there. So think about how you would get in there and do a search. Or do you have, again, single room occupancy? One of the big things I want to touch on with the search is I like to utilize an oriented search, which basically is going to leave an officer in the hallway and have his firefighters search the room while you have an oriented member with a tick in the hallway, uh, the common hallway of these buildings on the upper floors. They can do a search, but remember, are you searching a studio apartment that is wide open and all the walls have been removed? or bedroom. If you're not sure, either use a lifeline, I would suggest, or the oriented man. The oriented man in that, that hallway is your lifeline. Again, something that you need to get out and practice. You can practice on your apparatus floor. You don't need to bust into an ordinary type 3 downtown and say, hello, we're practicing our search. It can be done daily. Staffing. Chief Anthony Avilo, a mentor of mine. They, that staffing in these buildings can be a sponge. No better words could be said. You're going to have to have lots and lots of staffing to handle a fire in these. We talked about tin ceilings. I know working out is the right thing to do as a firefighter today. But I'm telling you, if you haven't pulled tin ceilings, you start pulling them, you're going to wear your people out very quickly, and they're going to be dog tired. And what's happening while they're dog tired? you're searching for more firefighters as the fire is jumping from store to store to store. You need personnel, as you can see there, to reinforce the main fire building, exposures, reinforce the roof operation, and provide relief to your fatigue companies, which is going to come very quickly. A quick look at basements. These buildings are going to have what the big box stores don't, and that's a basement. Do you have access to it from the outside? Or are they filled? As you can see on the left is a large furniture built, uh, store in my district that they utilize that basement as their storage. How are you going to get around that if it's filled with smoke? Uh, it, it's going to be tough. Uh, it is probably the most difficult fire you can face is going to be the basement fire on your main street. You're going to have to get ahead of it very quickly. Here you can see where one landlord has taken control of two buildings. So how does he control those two buildings? Simple. I'll knock a hole through the wall and we'll just move our stock back and forth. Well, you don't know, and there's a basement fire in the A building. It's going to head to the B building very quickly. Nothing's stopping it. Another hazard to basements, and I know I'm going mm -hmm. very quickly here, and, and again, I encourage you, if you are going to FDIC, you're going to get this in a pre-con where we will go very deeply into each one of these sections. Conveyor belts, something you don't see at the big box. How did they get their stock down? A conveyor belt. Well, that conveyor belt probably isn't going to get moved as you go from store to store, uh, new occupancy over time, and that conveyor belt's just sitting there. Heavy smoke condition, that conveyor belt can take a firefighter for a ride down into that basement and cause serious injury. Just something to consider that you're not going to see in the larger new mercantile conveyor belt. Keep an eye out on them when you're going through your main street building. Subsellers. So we're running short on time, but if anybody there in the right-hand corner, if you're a young person and you know what that square means there that the arrow is pointing to, good for you. Uh, but that is a sign for a fallout shelter during the, the, the Cold War years for bombing or during World War II. And a lot of times, if you see that, why is this light up? Well, if you see that square and you see fallout shelter, there might be a sub -cellar. That means that building was built as a, a, a large building. Again, the main street was where everybody shopped, everybody was at. Hey, they're bombing. Let's get in this building. A lot of times you see that they may have a sub cellar, which is a cellar under the cellar. And you could have storage in it. You have a fire in a sub cellar. Uh, forget it. I, I just don't, uh, it's going to spread. You need, again, to get ahead of it. But 
I put that on there for a little nostalgia. And if you do see it, the possibility exists that you might have a subseller. Basement safety. Quickly, leave a guy at the top of the stairs if you are going to attack down the stairwell. Again, we don't have a lot of time to discuss tactics. This is more of an overview. But if you are going to go, leave a firefighter at the top. Uh, we're coming up on the anniversary of uh, the 23rd Street fire in New York. If you haven't studied it, just Google FDNY 23rd Street fire. But one of the things that saved some of the members, 12 members perished at that fire from the FDNY. But one of the things that saved many more from being seriously injured and killed was that the engine crew left a man at the top of the stairs and he alerted the members down below of a problem when the, when the floor started to collapse. So if you are going down into this stairwell, leave somebody at the top of the stairs. Yes, we know we all carry radios and everything, but if he spots a problem, he can get on that new contraption called a radio and call it and tell you, get out or so on. Leave a set of eyes and ears at the top of the stairs. Some command issues, lots of eyes. You must be able to forecast fire travel, decentralize the fire ground, and get cannon reports from your exposures, the roof, all the corners, all the sides of the building. Hitting the hydrant. Do we want to hit the hydrant right in front if this building is on fire? You know, uh, residential structures, catch the hydrant, lay in. Well, how familiar are you with a reverse leg? Or maybe to enhance your water supply, put your pumper on the plug down the block. Uh, little things like that to boost your, your pressure. So don't always hit the hydrant in front. Uh, you may want to think about spotting down the street or tactically consider your hydrant options, especially when collapse is going to be a concern. If uh, you pull up and you got a lot of fire showing, think about where you're spotting your apparatus. Aerial and apparatus access alleys. Can you get your apparatus through there? Uh, the downtowns today now are the place to be. So they put up these fancy uh, Christmas lights year-round and these all these great things to, to draw attention to the downtown. Can your aerial get up in the air? A great, great evening training drill or uh, full-time department drill. Get out during the day. Get your aerial up in the air on your building. Get them down the alley. Can you access this building? Uh, a great drill. Kill two birds with one stone. You get training in your aerial operations, and you get to look at your building. Apparatus position, the time to figure it out is when you pull up, not after the fact. You're not going to be moving these apparatus. You want to make sure you're either at a flank, flanking position, or out of the collapse zone. Just one more thing to think about. Where's your water going? A lot of times the roof is burned away, and as you can see here, that stream, well, it's not really hitting anything. When it's considered a loss, or you want to protect what's not burned, think about getting up and under the fire. Get your streams through the upper floor windows and up, and blast away those voids, blast away those drop ceilings. Don't just assume that you're going to put the stick up and blow the water, thousands of gallons of water, down on top of the fire. One of the things that just really annoy me when I research these types of fires and any commercial building fire is that uh, the stick is 100 feet up, as high as it can go, and it's just pouring water down on top, and who knows what you're hitting. If you can get up and under, do so. Don't just always assume we're going to pour water from the top because, well, I saw it on a video. Also, with water, while we're on this slide, think about how many gallons per minute you're pouring into these buildings. The weight of that water, it could cause a serious collapse. It's always good to possibly take a break. Let the building settle before you go in and overhaul. Again, staffing. Do you have an adequate amount of safety officers to get in there? But if you're pouring a lot of water, okay, we knocked it down, Chief. Let's go. Hey, think twice. Let that building settle a little bit. Some more fire attack thoughts. 
again, sponge. You're going to have all kinds of problems. Get enough people to the scene to cut the fire off. Think about where you're going to be in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You must get ahead of these fires. What size hose lines? Again, you've heard me talk about the rope practice, and maybe the inch three quarter isn't going to, to be the end-all, fix-all for these buildings. Two and a half, teaming up companies on that two and a half. Things that we just don't do in residential dwelling fires, you may have to take advantage of, and you're not going to think of them at three in the morning while you're standing in front of your Main Street building. Again, there you have the apparatus positioning. We get to roofs. We're going to finish up with roofs and cockloffs. The cockloft is just a giant attic space. And mostly used, you, you, these buildings, are, again, were built HVAC. You know, insulation and, and air movement was big. And uh, so you would have these elaborate, ginormous cockloffs that could add to lots of fire spread and all kinds of gases building up. Pulling ceilings, as you know, as we talked about with tin ceilings, it'll be difficult. But let's say you don't have a tin ceiling and you're pulling lath and plaster. You must coordinate. You must coordinate pulling that, that ceiling and opening up the cock lock. It has to be coordinated. You need to get some of your best, brightest, smartest chiefs up on that roof to direct those efforts and be well coordinated. Another real quick thing as far as roofs. A little hint. may not always be the case, but a hint. You have heavy fire in the rear. The slopes of these buildings, uh, engine two to command, heavy fire in the rear. While you're in the front, you don't have those kind of conditions. You better put up the red flag of, uh-oh, we could have fire racing up to the front. And that is because these buildings are sloped for drainage, for water runoff. So heavy fire in the rear will give you more room for that fire to spread. So just something to think about. Heavy fire in the rear, another thought that you could get up to the front. Hey, I'm hungry. Let's have some dessert. Some tar cake, anyone? These buildings have had layers and layers and layers of tar on them. If you think you're going to go up and cut them immediately, hey, great. I, I wish you luck. But chances are on a 110-year-old building, you're going to have so much uh, tar on there, you're just going to bind up your saws. Some quick training. How quickly can you change the blade? Is that even feasible? Do you, how many blades? A lot of these fires happen and occur in very small towns. If you're lucky enough to have an aerial, how many saws do you have on your, your apparatus in your small XYZ fire department with uh, 20 volunteers or, or on-duty strength of five guys or what have you? Mutual aid is the go-to. And not only for staffing, but what kind of equipment does your mutual aid truck company carry? Can you get enough saws to the top? And again, it's all about coordination. You start cutting that roof and that wide open cock lock is full of those gases. It must be coordinated so you don't have any kind of smoke explosion or uh, a backdraft potential. So you want to coordinate when you're opening. Do you hear crickets? Good friend Colin Kelly from the West Coast Offense has done a wonderful job on uh, crickets. And uh, crickets is basically uh, where a the roof will meet the wall and it creates a gap and it's for water drainage and and um, you can have a whole space that you can have fire travel and again we're running towards the end here but just one more thing to research and look at is crickets and up on the roof their contribution to fire uh, travel not going to be too common on a lot of old, large spaces on older buildings, but they can be there. Just one more thing to take a look at. The scuttle knockout. One of the issues that you can find with the scuttle knockout uh, is you have access from the interior up onto the roof. Well, over time, the scuttle knockout can be boxed in with drywall. You go to open that up. You go up onto the roof and 
what's the first thing you want to do is all the natural openings, open up all the natural openings. Well, one of the things you'll do, okay, well, let's open up that scuttle. Well, there's no smoke coming out of it. Let's go. Hey, wait a minute. Think about that scuttle uh, knockout being there, that the drywall, as you can see in the bottom picture, the, the drywall there needs to be busted through, and that goes right into the cock lock. So if you want to invent that cock lock, you open that scuttle, take a quick look and make sure you don't have any kind of barrier or any kind of wall there that would impede smoke uh, getting out of that building. Renovation. If you see a dumpster, stop. Take a look. What's going on in your main street? There is a very... Uh, upscale town to the east of me, and they have built an entire main street that is fake. Okay, what I mean by that fake is the construction is lightweight, the fronts are fake facade. Anyway, it certainly doesn't look like my main street. But when you see a dumpster, that could be a sign that your 1860 main street is quickly becoming a 2015 constructed main street with trusses and all kinds of sea joists, metal sea joists, and everything that we have known as firefighters that will collapse and kill us, renovation. When you look at some of our worst tragedies, again, back to the 23rd Street collapse or the Von Dome Hotel collapse in 1972, uh, those were renovations that caused or were part of the dominoes that fell that un unfortunately led to the death. So, Renovations are going to be a huge problem with these main streets now and in the future. Uh, here on the left is a popular uh, building in my town that they have gutted, and I am not kidding you. On a Monday, that's what the, on the left hand side, last Monday, that's what the front looked like, and the next day, boom, they took that whole front out and they're they're working on it and making it uh, some outside dining. So be alert. I put that picture up there. Uh, be alert to um, renovation. Uh, one other fatal event that took place in New York City was in the Bronx was a renovation that killed uh, Howie Carplung. Uh, another good uh, line of duty death to study, but renovations, or what I would like to call hybrid downtown or hybrid buildings where you have a mixture of eras uh, going on that you must be alert to. A couple more slides and we'll finish up here. Old and new wood. Thanks again to Chief Avilo for supplying this picture. Uh, there, if you take a look on the left, is what you're going to find in your Main Street building. And on the right, say, well, we're going to fix this building up and we're going to use some old wood, old new wood. Well, it just doesn't exist. As you can see, the grains there that that wood on the left, the old wood that is the original, is going to take a lot of fire. And the new processed wood uh, is going to uh, collapse just as quickly as some of the trusses. So anyway, hybrid downtown buildings, hybrid Main Street buildings, be aware. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, allowing me to give this presentation. This is something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, and get out. In closing, I ask to get out and get into your building. And don't be sitting there at 3 in the morning with the mayor staring at you or the residents saying, wow, we've just lost our whole entire downtown. How did this happen? Try to be prepared for it. And that comes down to building construction and knowing these type three buildings. And again, um, I'll be at FDIC for a pre-con on this where we will get deep into every aspect. Thank you. That was a great job, Joe. We got a couple of uh, folks just saying thank you and great job. Eric Hawkins, uh, Milan, Mike Williams, a uh, bunch of uh, guys chiming in saying they loved it. Covered a lot of great stuff. I mean, things we've got to be considering all the time, especially renovations when it comes to downtown, access stairs, things of that nature that you know didn't exist when the building was first built. And now you've got a, a chimney built into the building, or 
you know, fuel loading, or in the case, in Howie's uh, case, how they removed supports for the floor, and yep. you know, uh, mm-hmm. there you go. So, uh, really good presentation. You, you covered it well. We we don't have a whole lot of questions. Um, we're, we're we're again uh, real grateful. Uh, really, uh, everybody's just chiming in saying, "Great show, great good good review, great show, very informative." Thank you, Bobby Hirschfeld there, Tommy Norris, Walter Gavin, a bunch of old friends chiming in saying thank you so much. So it's great to see the audience out there. Hey, remember, this uh, presentation is going to be archived for you. It will be available online for the next 24 hours if you want to use it for more training. Joe will be at FDIC. We're going to run another video real quick here just to pump our good friends at the uh, stair climb, and uh, and we'll let you go. So, Joe... uh, Aaron Helmels from Boise is chiming in. Brian Natovi, Kelly Zimmerman, everybody's letting you know you did a great job, buddy. We appreciate that. Thanks, um, Chief. And I, I just I just put up that last slide. If, if if you come up with a question after the fact, there's my email. Feel free to contact me, or if you have any thoughts or anything at all on this, or something new that you found in yours, there's my email. So I just wanted to put that back up. But uh, thank you, Chief. Outstanding. And and Mike, uh, Mike just asked us a question. Says, can we have him do a building class? Mike, I'm having him do one at FDIC. So sign up today. Registration <laughs> is open. And Joe will be doing a pre-conference workshop. Make sure you're in it, Mike. I'll be. I'll, I'm going to come to the class and look for you. So we'll, we'll hof- hopefully we'll get to see you there. Hey everybody, remember the stair climb is this Saturday, and uh, we're looking to get 1,500 people out there. We have got 1,500 slots. We got lots of slots open. We're really hoping to do this right. We're, we're uh, we really, really would love to see folks if you're in the uh, – Joe, it's not too far for you to drive, obviously. You're over no. in Ohio. So yep. we'd love to see if we couldn't get 1,500 folks. Hey, thank you so much, Joe, for joining with us today. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. Please enjoy this short video, and we'll see you all down the road. Hi, I'm Bobby Halton. I'm Rhoda May Kerr. And we're asking you for a favor. We need you to show up to do the stair climb at City Field. On October the 10th, it's the first national stair climb sponsored by the FDNY and the National Fallen Firefighters. And I gotta tell you, if there are 16,000 firefighters in the city of New York alone, 1,500 should be a piece of cake. They're saying it's impossible, but there's nothing impossible for the American Fire Service. We promise to never forget, Rhoda May and I are asking you, Help us help others to be successful. Thanks.